This is a Silver Linings Handbook podcast bonus episode. I'm Jason Blair. Hey friends, today we're sharing a bonus episode from our December meetup in Atlanta with several podcasters. There, I facilitated a discussion on the motivations behind hosting and producing true crime podcasts. The panel included Brandon Hall from Music City 911 podcast, Nina Instead from Already Gone, Dana Pohl from True Crime PI, Robert Palmer from the Broken System podcast, and Jason Ursay from Santa May Be a Criminal. For those of you who could not make it to the Omni Hotel in the Battery in Atlanta, I want to share this illuminating panel discussion with you and those who made it who would like to re listen. Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, what we're going to do today, we're going to do a bunch of different things today. We're going to do a panel with all of our podcasters here. We're going to do some trivia. We're going to do some other fun stuff. Um, I, I think it's awesome to have all these wonderful people here. Um, as somebody who's not uh, technically not a true crime podcast host, allegedly, do I have so many <laughs> true podcasters on? Um, I do really love the things that uh, one of the neat things for me about being a part of this community is really realizing the depth of caring, compassion that so many people are driven to this kind of work because they truly care and want to make a difference. So that I think we have a group of people here, and to you guys who are on the live too. Um, we have a group of people here who really sort of fit that mold and share that value. So I'm excited for this conversation. Um, Brett just left, but I want to give special credit to uh, Brett and Alice from the prosecutors, because at least for Jason, Robert, and I, and then I know all you all through Jason, um, that's the community that really brought us together. And for me, at least, uh, I never imagined that I would start following true crime podcasts and all of a sudden find a community of loving, caring, passionate friends, including you guys. Um, so, you know, part of what uh, I'll do quick intros to the people who are here and then let them introduce themselves. But part of what we're going to talk about today is really being able to explore what sort of motivates them to do what they do on their podcast the why behind what they do, and some ideas that they have um, for podcasting in the future. So I'll go in order here. We've got Brandon Hall. Um, Brandon, his podcast is Music City 911. He spent 20 plus years working as a 911 emergency dispatcher. And for me, it's fascinating, the idea of being able to bring that voice and that perspective to the world, because I don't think I know of uh, another podcast that's uh, – like that, but he really, uh, Brandon himself has been involved in things like the Nashville Christmas Day bombing in 2022, you know, floods, I think, and other, you know, your normal routine thing. He's the calm voice on the other end of the line that we all want uh, to be there. So I think it's awesome that he's bringing that into the world and helping us uh, learn from that. And then I've got Dana Pohl here from True Crime PI. Um, Journalism, communications, I can relate to that, and I'm glad you don't hate me. Um, <laughs> I always have to worry every time I hang out with a journalist. But also, um, studied library information and science. And for those of you who listen to our podcast, it's obviously deeply researched and reported, so you can see those skills um, coming up there. But part of the reason why I think it stands out is definitely for the research, but the exploration, and it's very similar for Nina at the other end of the table, of the unidentified and the missing. You know, the people who don't make the big headlines, they don't make the front page stories, but there's still families out there who are hurting or wondering. 
And, you know, the idea that some of the missing may be brought home alive, some of the unidentified may be identified. Some of the missing, we may figure out what happened to them, even if it's a bad outcome. It's really healing and powerful for the families. And it's nice to have podcasts that are focused on that area. And then we have the clown, Jason. <laughs> um, I think you're my most frequent guest. No, you're tied from Julia Cali right now. Uh. But uh, Jason Ursi from the And Maybe a Criminal podcast. I'm going to keep this really short because I love telling the story of your podcast. <laughs> but Jason brings the true crime, uh, brings to the true crime world uh, a satirical podcast that explores whether Santa is a criminal. But what I like to say is his podcast isn't really about that. It's about love, joy, hope, grace. Sort of the meaning of Christmas, and we're searching for that that thing, that magical thing. And I do appreciate your podcast. And then finally, Robert Palmer, not finally, sorry, yeah, um, <laughs> Robert Palmer. He's the host of the Broken System podcast. Um, you know, Robert's podcast really explores. Uh, you know, in its first season, he'll tell you about it. Nasak explores a case, uh, DJ Fecky. And it's one of, one of the neat things about Robert's podcast is it really does explore the systems around the criminal justice system and what might be broken and gives you a roadmap on what to fix. But in that first season, one of the coolest things is he explored the, you know, a kind of case that might surprise you in terms of, um, how it doesn't get attention. And that's a white male who ends up the victim of a, a violent crime. In this case, also drug addiction and other things played a role. But he's shining, kind of like Nina and Dana are, shining a light on an area that we sometimes don't pay a ton of attention to. And then Nina Instead. Sorry, Nina. <laughs> From the Already Gone podcast. Um, Nina lives in the Atlanta area, but her podcast started focusing on the Great Lakes region and yeah. um, Michigan. And very similar to Dana in the sense that she explores a lot of cases that involve missing, unidentified people, brings uh, an interesting perspective and a unique perspective to all of that. So I think you guys, hopefully you get an idea of what I was saying in the beginning, that this is a really neat group of podcasters with really neat values who are trying to bring good things to the world. So... I'll go ahead and facilitate the conversation. I'll try to talk. Who are you? Normally. <laughs> who are you? Yeah, who are you? Oh, that's a really good point. Jason Blatt. I am the host of the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast. Um, we are not sure about podcasts. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. So we, our podcast began earlier this year. Um, and initially, we were really focusing on psychology and some of the things that I do right now. My background is a former journalist. Um, I am a executive coach and a life coach now. Um, but what we found as we started doing episodes was, uh, despite all my great planning, my podcast really wasn't about what I thought it was about. It's really about conversations with really interesting people that where we learn about the world, where we grow, and where we're inspired. Um, and no matter what I try to do, <laughs> no matter what angle I try to take, it comes back, uh, comes back to those things. So I'm really thrilled to be able to facilitate this conversation. Hopefully, I'll do a relatively decent job. <laughs> um, but uh, so for our guests, I'm going to go ahead and grab a seat and get us started. Um, I wanted to start with Jason, since you're the one who sort of brought us all together. Um, you know, I, I you're sort of the outlier in the group. You're a fictional podcast. No. <laughs> <laughs> you are also the glue that holds us all together. Um, but one of the things... You know, as somebody who's not really a true crime podcaster, but who really is interested in some of the related topics, I was thinking about the idea that your podcast is about true crime, but it's, I think it's fictional and it tells the story of an investigative podcaster, mm -hmm. shocking, um, who's Richie. And he's really on that quest to find out what they're saying as a criminal. But I wanted to ask you, like, what you really wanted to try to bring in the world. Well, I mean, I think that um, there are a lot of interesting conversations in the true crime space, um, particularly right now. And I wanted to, um, I love true crime podcasts, so I wanted to do something that I was interested in. I love Christmas um, and I wanted to to shine a light on that. It brings me a lot of joy. 
Um, but um, I wanted to to take a different path to explore the sa- a lot of the topics that we're talking going to be talking about today, um, but from a from a lens of um, from a naive sort of perspective. You know, um, I wanted Richie to start out really not very good at what he was doing. I wanted the show to sound better as the show continued on, even though I work in uh, television. So I knew how to do it, but I wanted it. I wanted it to be very intentional that Richie was learning what he was um, going along as he was going along. But I just thought it'd be fun to um, have some of these conversations that go on in the true crime space from a place that we could laugh about because I think, I mean, it's really easy for for people to get really angry and there's a lot of anger in the true crime space when it should be a place um, that's really accepting. It's kind of uh, interesting because one of the things that I often think about when I'm listening to podcasts is, wow, these are all the things that are like going on under the surface yeah, in the true crime space that nobody really openly wants to talk yes. about. But like we're able to talk about it through Yeah, sports. right, right. I get away with a lot because it's satire, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I I just wanted to kind of take a take a run at at those conversations, and and I also wanted it to be something that people who like true crime could listen to and still feel happy after they listen to it, you know? Because I know that a lot of the, a lot of topics you all do like on your shows are really difficult topics, and um, I know that takes an emotional toll on the creators um, that listeners sometimes want to take a break from that kind of stuff so i sort of counter programmed it as well um so yeah that's kind sort of, of i i've heard you i don't think you describe it this way but i think one of your was so described it as kind of like a palate cleanser i've heard that a lot actually yeah it's the sorbet that we can yes eat. yeah <laughs> it's yeah, which is great i mean I, I love i love being in that space you know and i have a lot of respect for everybody that does the work that, that i i personally I can't research, hence why if trivia was uh, generated by ChatGPT today. I don't know if it's correct, if the answers are right, but that's what ChatGPT told me. But um, but yeah, no, I just I have a lot of respect for the people that put in like the hard work, the really emotionally taxing work in these these shows, um, and and all the other creators. Um, so I just want to do something a little different and give somebody a little bit of a laugh here. Hopefully, people laugh about it. So. So, so that's sort of like what you're looking to your listeners to get. That yeah, absolutely. Right absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask you the same thing, Nina, and just thinking about your podcast and, you know, you explore, I think a lot of top, tough topics, but at the same time, things that, you know, aren't getting covered by everyone. What were you looking to bring in the world with yours? So when I started the podcast, I really wanted to focus on cases that were in the area where I lived, like places that I knew, because that was interesting to me. And then I found myself working as a missing persons advocate, which really changed my perspective, because mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I, I was dealing with these families that were struggling and were in crisis. And it gave me a totally different perspective on the work. How did it, how did it change your perspective? I realized how important it was to be careful and thoughtful when creating because the families listen, the the friends listen, the communities listen. This is someone that they knew, someone that they cared about. So it's very important how you speak of the, of the missing person or of the murdered person and how they ended up that way. The tiny word talking about the background, the yes. way that you kind of, yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think of that as a, and some of the true crime discussions, <clears throat> you know, some of the creators are often, you know, not necessarily talking to victims. They're going off of news report. And I just remember as a as a journalist that once you sort of sit in the room with the person who just lost their loved one, or even the family of the person who's the suspect, it really changes your perspective on even the smallest, smallest words. And I was just having a conversation it may have been on the podcast i don't know it all blurs for me <laughs> but about a situation that we had where we were reporting on a story and they're really gruesome details uh, and it it was an important story but there was no reason to put the gruesome details it added no value it told you nothing new and um 
And it's just really interesting that once you've been in that room, you t- take care to do things that you wouldn't mm-hmm. normally like. It gives you a thoughtfulness, I think. What originally got you interested in it at all? I know you said you wanted to focus on the style. So when I was a little girl, there was a serial killer murdering children in the area that I lived in. And they took a child from the school that I ended up attending from my neighborhood. So ever since I was literally a toddler, they're like serial killers or something I've been aware of. Wow. And this person was never found or identified. Cool. How did you get to you? Growing up in Oakland County with the Oakland County child killer being active, I think it affected all of us kids and our parents that it gives you a situational awareness that kids who didn't grow up around this may not have because it was very real. But it had that, I would imagine, also change your life in real tangible ways. Like maybe your parents would have let you. Oh, parent. Well, my parents would let me do it. They were never <laughs> right. right. So maybe not your parents. Maybe not mine. <laughs> but other parents became very mindful and uh, stopped letting kids walk to school. Like the, the elementary school that I attended for kindergarten didn't have a drive up lane to pick up kids. And they needed it because a girl from that school was murdered in the neighborhood. And I remember walking to school with my grandmother and seeing all of these cars jammed up around the school because there was no place for them to go. And it was, you know, there's a little bit of chaos involved. And I think that that sort of disorganized but very intense scenario was was left an impression. Yeah, I was recently talking to someone about Delphi, Indiana, where you know, Abby and Libby were lost. And, um, you know, we, we were talking about the idea of, you know, someone writing a book to tell the story. You know, after listening to them, I was like, oh, no, that's that's not the right book. The whole town is a victim. Like, that yes. town is forever changed in ways mm-hmm. that we don't read about and that we don't see. Um, and it's not just the fear. It's the media coverage. It's the other things along those lines. To, and uh, I was talking to them. They said, yeah, the, the town is trauma. Absolutely. The entire- town is traumatized it's trauma on top you know well thanks for um thanks for answering that and thanks for going there i I turn it to um i'm gonna mix it up and throw it to you brandon what what were you looking to bring in the world with yours you know i just thinking about the idea that like uh, there isn't another podcast out there did you did you even know it would be as successful as it was what were you looking what does success count as yeah well um when i started it was me and another uh, dispatcher believe it or not he 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 had just retired he had been a dispatcher for 40 years oh and um at that that point i was you know i've been there 20 so we've been you know friends for literally decades and uh it's kind of started off as just kind of a buddy chat type thing where it was you know, we thought we were going to have other 911 dispatchers listening and police officers, stuff like that. And that's where we thought it was going to go. But he had, um, he had retired. He wanted to fully retire. He had no idea how much work and effort went into <laughs> a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he wanted to just remain fully retired. And, um, you know, I took it on myself and I had random guests past that, but it, it just took a little while. But really the biggest thing was just letting people know about people they are now one dispatchers i mean mm-hmm. growing up everybody has an idea of what a police officer does or what a yeah. what a firefighter does or you know just about any job like that but there are so few now one dispatchers in comparison and they're all kind of behind the scenes they're faceless you don't know what actually happens other than the rare case of you know an hour one call getting released to a, a news outlet oh, or something like that it's it, which is still pretty rare I wanted to, to bring that out to the forefront and um, doing that, showing what sort of things we actually go through as dispatchers um, there for the longest time, we were just considered secretaries. And I think still in some States it's considered that we were in Tennessee. Luckily we're now considered first responders. Um, but you know, it was the same classification as a uh, school secretary, for instance, you know, that we had the same type of, nationwide classification so that's one of the things sorry I might have been <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah i just wanted to bring it out and show what was going on um kind of behind the scenes telling what we look for and also 
I try to be, you know, I, that's one of the things with true crime. It is entertainment for a lot of people. And I, I can understand that, but I wanted to do that as well as be educational with it. So let people worry about it. I remember when, um, many years ago, I had a woman who came to work to our off at our office, uh, as I forget what, what job, I think it was office manager. And she had worked, this is in Fairfax County, Virginia. She had worked as a 911 dispatcher and she had done the training. And in DC, you have to get certain clearances because you're involved in, you know, so it's a real investment mm-hmm. in addition to the regular training. But after about six months, she stopped. And I asked her, well, yeah, we're hiring in six months. And why did you, why did you stop? And she said, it, it's too much. You're involved in everything that goes wrong mm-hmm. in the world. And um, I think for me, that was the first time I really thought about that kind of job. Even though I was a journalist and I covered crime, it was the first time I really thought about that job as being a frontline responder, as dumb as that is, right? Like, it's dumb for me to miss that one, at least in my mind. Uh, but you're, it's the one place that's involved in every. Yeah, and it's uh, a lot of people don't realize too the amount of calls that are taken in. Like a police officer may go on two, three calls per day, and uh, now one dispatcher may get anywhere from 100, 150, 200 calls they're helping out with every single day. So it's uh, there's a lot of things just people don't know about it, and that's what I try to bring to life to people. Very cool. Well, glad it's here. I know it's popular. I know everybody loves it, and. and uh... I'm glad, Jason, that you introduced us. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess, Robert, I'll throw it to you, and then we can wrap with Dana. Um, what were you looking to do when you started your podcast? I know you were on my podcast, and then one of the questions I asked you was, um, you know, did you come up with a podcast, the idea of doing a podcast first or the story first, and you really were inspired by listening to another podcast and the way that they – handled the story and said, I want to do it the opposite. <laughs> Absolutely. So for me, it, it, it started as, you know, I knew I wanted to do a podcast. I didn't know what I wanted it to be about. I came up with a name thinking one way that I was going to go. And then I started researching cases of, of, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts. I listened to all you guys and so many more every day, just constantly. It's part of my life. And I, uh, knew that I wanted to do something. I just didn't know what it was. As I started researching, I came across DJ's story and it was such an impactful story for me because one, it was local, it was close to home. And I just felt that, you know, Amanda had done such a good job with getting her DJ story out there, talking to people and every podcast that had done it had spent that 30 or 45 minutes on it and moved on. There was a couple that did a little bit more, but when I, I started researching the case and realizing what was going on, I felt like it needed so much more attention and to get, you know, his story out there from start to finish, the good and the bad. So that's kind of where my direction went with his story. And it just kind of evolved into what it, what it did with his story. And it, it was so important to me because it it really pulled on me. It really, you know, I felt like Amanda needed it. I felt like Amanda needed that extra support, that extra push because, you know, she'd been dealing with it going on, you know, seven years and Amanda's his sister and, and she just, you know, she had went through so much in her personal life and things like that. And it, it really takes a toll and it goes back to, you know, when you start talking to victims, families and, and understanding what they go through, I don't know how she did it for as long as she did. It, it takes so much out of them and puts so much, it takes so much away from their current family that's there right mm-hmm. now that people don't see, you know, people don't understand what they're going through. So that was why I wanted to focus on that. And then it just kind of, it morphed into what it is now and it's continued to still grow and, and change. Every time I go into another episode, I realize there's other things that I can do um, to bring light for, you know, victims you know, and the justice system that that's failing. Was there something about DJ's story that you related to? You know, it 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 was just so much that that he as a victim was being ignored. 
And I think that was probably the the thing that pulled on me so much is that we, no matter what the evidence showed, no matter what you could see that was right in front of you, his case was being ignored because he had an addiction. And that to me is is we shouldn't pick and choose victims. We should be able to start to finish a victim as a victim no matter what their background is. Sir, the, the circumstances may come out to be that it was, you know, something in that. But from the beginning, it needs to be treated as a victim, not as a just a number that they're trying to cross off the list. I remember I I talked about him. <clears throat> Mom passed away in October and someone came to me and they said, you know, there's the first death that a person has, which is when they physically die. And then the second death is what we forget about. And, you know, that's one of the neat things about for the, certainly for the three of you guys, Nina, Dana, and Robert, that you're keeping these people alive and keeping their stories um, alive. And, and Robert, I really relate to that point of like feeling like you're not listened to, right? I think, <laughs> I think there's probably moments for all of us where we felt that. And, um, you know, you think about a lot of the podcasts we listen to, you know, Brett made a brilliant point to me that I had totally blindsided me, or not blindsided me, surprised me. But we were talking about some of the debates and some of the negative things going on in the true crime podcast world. And he was, said, on the flip side, it's not the mainstream media that's going to be covering the missing and murdered uh, Native American women or you know, uh, minority victims or people who are poor. And that part of what podcasts can do is really shine a light. And we've seen examples like your own backyard with the mm -hmm. Kristen Smart case. Um, and we've seen, I mean, we've seen other examples of that. Uh, there's podcasts are doing something very similar in Idaho and Washington right now, um, bringing cases toward resolution. So, you know, it's neat to see you guys bring those. Um, things in the world, which is a great transition for Dana. <laughs> what were you looking for? So I had been researching the missing un and unidentified since 2005. Um, as soon as NamUs came online. Um, and that's the national. National. Persons yes. And um, I found the Doe Network. I became, you know, just totally invested in making comparisons between missing people and unidentified people. What was it that it originally got you to even think of that? Like, just so I, I mean, I think it is, uh, it literally, I think goes back to being a child during the milk carton mm -hmm. missing mm -hmm. children's campaigns. I mean, every morning I would sit with my cereal Ladies. Yeah, uh, yeah, I well, remember. in the seventies too. 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I would sit and read the milk carton, and and I just it was so, it shocked me that children would go missing. It shocked me that families would not know where their children. Like I just couldn't understand it. Yeah, I just and and so I think that follow through. I am a big mystery reader, have always been a big mystery reader. I, I really like that. My favorite shows were detective shows. So I think all of that sort of combined. Wow. Um, yes. In 1996, I had my son. That was the year that John Bonet uh, case uh, became. Yeah. And so I was now a new mom and I was just overwhelmed by that. And so I think that's really where it just all came together and I started doing the research. And so did that for many years um, and, you know, was able to submit some cases, you know, some some near matches or some potential matches that could be looked at. So it was a lot of work, a lot of nope, sorry, that isn't a match. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But also it was very gratifying to reach out to law enforcement and say, just want you to remember this case is happening and this person could be a potential match. Would you mind looking into it? So that happened. And, and then in 2018, I moved to Georgia. I started looking at Georgia cases and I found Cobb County Jane Doe, as I call her. Um, she was a she was missing 36 years at the time. And she, I'm sorry, she was unidentified. 
So this case is, she was discovered in 1984 and she was unidentified for 36 years. I think I remember this case because I lived in Marietta. Yes. Yes. Wasn't there some news on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I said, you know what, I'm going to do a blog post. And just as I was getting ready to do this blog post, the Samuel Little sketches hit the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And I started looking at them, and there were Atlanta cases. And I said, oh, my goodness, like this he red. Was the, like, prolific serial killer. Yes. Who... Yes. Ninety. Hey. He claims 90, at least 99 victims. Um, and he traveled all throughout the United States. Georgia was, de- he was born in Georgia, and he returned to Georgia several times. So I started looking, and I found a redheaded woman who could potentially, the sketch could potentially match the dough. And so I just put out a blog post and then I said, you know, that's not enough. You know, I, I need to do more. And so I started the podcast to cover that case. Okay. okay. And so that, that was, um, enlightening. I thought it was going to be one episode and then I was going to have to figure out what I was going to do next. <laughs> and that's what I thought too. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and it ended up being a seven part series because I was able to connect with a retired homicide and cold case detective who had looked at her case many times. And he was willing to talk to me and he actually made the strong connection. He said, I said, you know, I was kind of afraid to ask because I was like, I'm going to sound silly whenever I ask him, could this be a, could she be a victim of Samuel Little? He's going to think I'm crazy. And I asked and he said, the most potential suspect in this case is Samuel Little. And so through his research, he had come to that conclusion, tried to get the Texas Rangers to get an answer from, from Samuel Little and, um, were unable to get it, it confirmed. And so that's really what started my kind of passion for these cases and bringing does to, to light, um, sharing their stories and providing, you know, background. So somebody might be able to say, Hey, I remember a woman from night that disappeared in 1984 or I never saw her again. Um, so yeah, that, that was, that's what does it. I- that whole story makes me wonder about something. Also, something you said, uh, uh, Brandon, about um, podcasting or true crime also being about entertainment. I was on um, a podcast recently. I was interviewed a woman named uh, journalist named Rosemary Mayo, who has a podcast called On the Break. And at the in the middle of one question, she asked me, "Why did you decide to go back into journalism again?" And I. Th- I was like caught off guard. I was like, I have not decided to take back adults. She was like, you sit, you interview people, you're a journalist. And I'm like, Um, because I think of myself more from like the advocacy side or I would have never gone back to the journalism side, but we'll leave that one unresolved. Um, (laughs) But I, I, it makes me wonder in thinking about what you're saying, Dana, and what you guys are saying, what do you consider yourself? Like, are you an entertainer? Are you a journalist? Are you an advocate? Or is it some combination of all of that? What do you guys consider yourself? An investopodster. <laughs> I like that. Me That's too. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Call it edutainment. <laughs> That's a, yeah. It's a great way to mm-hmm. think about it. You know, edu- edutainment. Anyone else have thoughts on that, Dana? I mean, I like to consider myself an investigator, hence the PI at the end of my name, um, <laughs> you know, the podcast name. Um, but I think it's about education. It's about amplifying the voices of the voiceless for me. And Robert, I imagine it'd be something similar. It's exactly, yeah, I, I would say exactly. I, I, I consider myself an advocate. And yeah. that's, that's mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not a journalist. I'm not an entertainer. Yeah, I guess. Entertainer. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, one of the interesting things is you guys all do a little bit of each of those things, right? There's a little, uh, there's an element to it that's investigating. There's an element to it that's research. There's an element that involves communication and communicating to the public. How about you, Brandon? What are you? What are you? I don't know how you'd really classify it, but I mean, <clears throat> just pushing. The, the fact, like I said, kind of before, the 911 dispatcher, how they would have to deal with these horrible, horrible calls for someone else's uh, horrible piece of their life that's happening, not just, you know, right then. It's a lot of times the very first minute or second that they have found out this 
horrible thing is happening. And you're right there. I, one of the things I've kind of mentioned on the show before is that, you know, if you have a domestic violence situation, a lot of times when they call you on the phone, it is going on right then. It's really, really bad. You can hear screaming and things being thrown around. And then in the course of time that a police officer can go out there, they completely change their, it's completely, the way, different. Yeah, it's completely different dynamic. So you're really hearing the nitty gritty of everything that's going on right then and there as soon as it's happening. Sort of like an intense, unique moment in no. the lives that they I'm I'm guessing they probably couldn't even explain it afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Most people don't, uh, you know, if they try to recall their nine one one call, they don't really remember too much about that. That's and funny. the dispatcher is also kind of the same way. I mean, because we deal with so many I've I've said it before. I can remember remember some of the calls that I took when I was a first month dispatcher. I can't remember some of the calls I took last week. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That they were that impressionable. Yeah. I never really thought of then when you're at a unique, intense moment in people's lives that, you know, maybe the scariest, most frightening, most dangerous moment and you're there for the that's it's interesting. Interesting. When you think of it. And then last but not least, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> oh no outside of you know it's funny because you know you and i will do battle with this you can call yourself an entertainer i call you the spreader of love um, but go ahead how do you see yourself i mean i i mean obviously there's the show is is entertainment um and i have a lot of fun doing it um and i do like i i, I think sort of sometimes I, I do try to spread joy and love and all that um but i do think Again, sometimes I'm trying to facilitate conversations or say things to make people think about the conversations that go on in the space mm -hmm. um, so that maybe they, they will, I mean, I don't want to say approach things the right way, but differently, you know, with more kindness because mm -hmm. everything is so yeah with more kindness because there's everybody's so angry all the time and you know i i don't want to be angry i just want to make people laugh and be happy <laughs> you know and be nice so um yeah i mean it's just uh kind of taking a a, a fun well, look like in look the mirror things, you can look at things the exact same way like a bad event happens mm -hmm. and you can look at it as something ugly or something to be angry about mm -hmm. or or you could look for opportunity. Yeah, right? sure. You can look for gratitude in places. Right. Uh, but I, I, for you, you know, there's, I'm going to slap myself bringing this up, but there's the whole ethics and true crime mm -hmm. debate. And you, you guys, well, you may not know, but Jason knows I've stuck my head. Oh. <laughs> I've stuck my head into it. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious from, your perspectives what what does it mean to be an ethical podcaster period uh for me it's it's kind of difficult sometimes because um i'm trying to portray what a 911 dispatcher would would be experiencing while they're taking this call at the same time that i'm playing a call because i play real 911 calls on the show um this really kind of concentrated immense like um really hardcore portion of this person's life um and it's it's kind of difficult to to do this sometimes i mean yet i'm a lot of times at odds saying should i play this on the show should i do this and um you know most of the time i end up saying yes because people need to know that this is what a novel one dispatcher actually will deal with and a lot of times multiple times a day and kind of the effects that it might have on some people. I mean, it, a dispatcher, one dispatcher may take this as a, you know, oh, it was just another call. And, you know, <laughs> I have to say that's, I, mean, I kind of find that way about myself because I yeah. take one call and it's a really bad call. And the next second I'm right on another call. Uh, some dispatchers may not feel that way. They have to, you know, get up for a minute. They have to walk away from their headset and their computer. And sometimes it just, it might be an in incident that just really sticks with them and they have varying levels of PTSD. So to the ethics part of it, um, on my show, it's kind of hard to really lay that down because, um, 
an ethical person may say, okay, I don't want to play this, but at the same time, I'm trying to push the the knowledge that these uh, dispatchers, I mean, it's rarely I'm, am I on the show like with my calls, but uh, that these dispatchers have to deal with. So that's being that that's my forefront, showing the dispatcher and what they're doing. Um, I want to be able to push out these really hard and, you know, uh, I guess divisive topics. And it know? sounds like you do have like some kind of ethical framework, some kind of balancing act that yeah. you're doing. Um, because I think, I mean, there there is this broader true crime ethics debate, but I also think that our ethics are really rooted in our own morals and our own values, not so much, so not necessarily publicly the way that it's been portrayed, but certainly it sounds like what you were describing was kind of an ethical balancing. What do you weigh when you're deciding whether to include uh, if If it just kind of sticks out to me, um, some of the, you know, here recently, because my podcast, I'm just probably just like any, any podcast changes a long time. Um, I don't really do the extreme deep dives that some other shows do. And in fact, uh, like this past uh, episode I did, I had three separate incidents on it okay. in the course of about uh, 30, 35 minutes. So it's enough to where you can get a, an outline of what happened. It's mostly, again, with the, almost probably like the feel of being there, yeah. getting that many. And, and plus the, the fact, too, that uh, a lot of people don't know this. Most dispatchers don't know what happened after they get off the phone call. They never find out. They, yeah. So I, I try to bring a little bit of that as well. Um, there's been calls that I've taken, and then a couple of days later, I'll see a news in an article about it. I'm like, oh, so that's what happens. Mm-hmm. And I, so a lot of it ends up just unresolved. Because some of no, it's, uh, it's not going to make it in the news. Well, yeah, it's uh, most people don't know that most of the crime that happened does not end up in the news. So, like, you see that a shooting happened at, uh, you know, a Kroger or something like that, <laughs> um, that you might see that. But um, you don't know that there's been probably 20 or 30 other shootings that happened that were unreported to the news. Right, right. Is it hard to not know? Yeah, it's not really not anymore. I, I yeah, kind of found a place that, you know, uh, for instance, uh, probably about a month or a month or two ago, I, I was right at the end of my shift. And the last call that I got was a guy that says, um, my brother's inside and he is, um, he has a sword to his chest. He's threatening to kill himself. And I stayed on the phone with him for about, it's probably four or five minutes while the police were on the way there. And he says, oh, the, the police are here now. And I was like, okay, I'll go ahead and let you go. I got up and left. No idea what happened. So, I mean, it's, you just kind of get used to it after a while. You know that you're, there's a big puzzle that happens with police, fire, medics, uh, district attorneys, prosecutors, whatever like that. Um, you have a role in it and that's your role. Once you're finished with it, there's nothing more for you to do. Mm-hmm. This is far afield from the, <laughs> uh, the ethics debate, but that where you're saying just made me wonder, like, you know, in some of the work I do, I've worked, I've worked with EMTs, I've worked with, you know, like whether it's psychologists or police officers or, um, like, how do you stay whole and bring your walls down and take risk in life and be vulnerable when you're constantly surrounded by, you know, people being harmed or bad things yeah. happening. I, I, I tell this story all the time about like being a crime reporter and this one story, cause I had become kind of like immune to it all. And this one story of this little girl was walking by a school building and a brick fell off the side of the building, hit her in the head. She died. Just mm-hmm. really- and the randomness of death, for some reason, that stuck in my head. But I realized over time, I stopped feeling the bad things, which then made it really hard to find joy or take risks or be bought. And I guess this is a decent question for all of you guys because you're immersing yourself in these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But start with you, Brent. Uh, I mean, I look around and everybody's a suspect. I mean, then, I mean, I had to like be kind of comedic like that, but I mean, I, it it does make you think about things differently in the world. I mean, the, you you know, my, I would love to be one of the people that are completely oblivious to what happens really in the world every day. Um, you know, people can walk through a downtown area and and have the 
blind sense of knowledge that they are completely and totally safe and nothing's ever going to happen to them. And, you know, I, I'll walk down the same place they do when I'm looking around for people with a weapon or mm-hmm. some sort of bad thing that's happening, just anything like that. And it's, um, I think most dispatchers, police officers, they all have that kind of, even without really thinking about it, like it's, it's there in their mind somewhere. And that, you know, I don't think we think often about people, whether they're first responders or others, or like even you guys as podcasters, that you're paying an emotional price for the rest of us to do what you're doing. Dana? That question? Okay. Um, So. I switch questions when I find that out. Yeah. (laughs) So can you repeat it? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about just sort of that idea of how do you manage the emotional toll of what you're doing while at the same times, uh, same time staying whole because there's so many negative things that we're involved in. There's so many, you know, we're hearing victim stories and we're hearing the risks they took, you know, might affect our willingness to be vulnerable and take risks may change our lives. So like, how do you stay whole in doing all of this? So I really feel that reading about these cases, um, learning about these cases, I'm driven to learn about them because I care about the people. And so it's a way for me to take my, you know, what my, I have a passion for this. I want to help. I want to provide answers. I want to, you know, bring this story to the forefront and maybe generate a lead or whatever. So I think that what I do is I really strongly focus on what the result of what I can do to make this better. Now, agreed, you know, you look at the world differently. You think like I, I have a friend who has a daughter and she gets so tired. She's 12. And she gets so tired of me saying, okay, be careful when she's on the internet because of it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so I become like this, you know, advice giver, this educator at any drop of a hat. Um, I have two sons and I would tell them things like, if you go out to a bar, you know, a lot of young men are, are disappearing late night at a bar. They end up in the river. Don't, you know, just be aware. Um, so, yeah, so I'm always, you know, people kind of, yeah, yeah, don't put your drink down. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so there is that. Um, I feel that I'm, I like that because I feel like I'm educated. I don't like not being in the know. And so I like to balance, you know, it's like a balance is, the world for me. Like I get to be in the know, but it really doesn't affect me. Like when I meet people, when it almost makes you less anxious about them. I think it actually does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. It's not the first time I've heard some version of once it makes sense, it becomes a little bit Mm -hmm. easier to walk. Jason, I'm going to skip you because you're the one that makes sense. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to Nina than Robert. <laughs> so for me, it's that if this person can endure what they went through, I can sit with it for a week or two. Mm-hmm. You know, I have the the ability to let it go, and they don't, and their loved ones don't. Okay. So it's almost like it becomes a bit of a gift. I can give it back. I can help you. Yes. And like, mm-hmm. yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Rob. So for me, it's it. I, I can answer both your questions with this with this sound okay, one. Cool. So I become emotionally involved with all everyone that I every case that I I look at, and it, it's different levels of emotion. Obviously, some I'm, I get drawn in and and it pulls me in, and I have to take myself out of the situation for a small break, listening to Jason, to watching stupid shows on TV that have nothing to do with true crime. But I feel that. It helps me be better and it continues to let me be a better advocate because I do get emotionally involved. And I think on the ethical side, when people lose that emotion and it becomes a task or their mindset thought becomes about making money and they take that emotion out of it, they stop realizing that there's two sides to every story. They can't, they can't take that middle ground and right. be objective 
they're going to stand on their hill and fight it till the end, no matter what that result is. And to me, that's where the ethical portion comes in as, as they become unethical and not saying that everybody that does that is unethical, but their actions show to be more unethical than, than normal. Yeah. Than what they should be for what they're, for what we're doing. Bring less good. Yeah. I am telling someone recently that I don't like to be in the public spotlight. I've done enough of that, but, um, you know, the Delphi case really gets under my skin as somebody who's a former journalist and, you know, thinking about on one hand, like mainstream media has been like a on the story, but we live in a whole new paradigm with like YouTube creators and other things along those lines. So this is a topic I've sort of stuck my head out on and gotten a couple of whacks at it. Accusations, very interesting things. But, um, you know, I was just on the Murder Sheet podcast with Kevin Greeley and Anya Kane, and we were we were sort of talking about the idea that there are a lot of overwrought debates about ethics, but there's some plain things out there that we collectively, let's say, as the broader true crime community, did I just say me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> as I'm trying to pull myself out, but I keep finding myself back in. Um, but that 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 there. Are, all the good that we're talking about comes in the world, but there are these sort of like blatantly to the point Robert was making about like sticking to your point and not being open to ideas or exploitive stuff or, um, you know, and I think for me, maybe that's part of the reason why I like I try to hide out of true crime and make it nebulous is like, there's a part of me that's so proud to be a part of this group. And then there's part of me, that is just kind of ill at some of what happens. And we don't have clear guidelines or definitions or anything like that. But, um, and it's been tough to navigate, right? Like, cause there are times where I've thought, huh, I'll have this person as a guest on my show. And then I research a little bit and I'm like, I will never have this person <laughs> anywhere near me. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, spinning it into a positive, right? Like, what are some of the things that we as creators can do to either improve the work we do or the community, the broader true crowd community that we have? Jason, I'll give you that one. Oh, man. <laughs> Tell jokes. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, this is a difficult question because I try to, um, I've stuck my head in a couple times too, you know, and I've gotten some wax at it. Um, but I think for me, the, the, the thing that bothers me the most in this conversation as a whole, this big conversation is when the victims are forgotten and when the focus, I, Robert said it perfectly a couple of minutes ago. Um, I mean, I also, the Delphi thing to me, I get really upset and emotional about that because, um, I mean, it's just tragic, you know, and that's obviously one of the hornet's nests in this space right now. There's a lot of really, really ugly things happening. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Why'd you, why'd you ask me? I got dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> it's kindness, Claus. Um, why did I ask you? Well, I mean, I think part of... Well, first of all, let's start with the fact that you know everyone. <laughs> I've a lot of people. You get along with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, whether you really like them or not, I don't know. But <laughs> you get along with everyone. But I, but I also think like you do care about those things like helping people, staying yeah. victim-centric. Um, and you're able to bridge the gap. And now I'm actually being serious and find common ground with a lot of people who are very different. Than, yeah. So that's kind of why I thought. Well, you know, I think just it, it goes back to what I said earlier is that I just my my default mode is to be kind. And I think that's why um, I have so many people that I get along with. And, you know, I think um, I, I genuinely do want to help. Um, I want to help everybody, really. Um, that's why I'm so glad that my podcast has been so well received because it seems to be helping people. 
Like I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me and said, I used to hate decorating for Christmas and now I love it because I listen to your show when I do it. Um, or I ride around and look at Christmas lights. I mean, like they had lost a loved one and then yeah, last Christmas they came across your show or it, it had happened several years uh-huh. back and they were dreading Christmas, but it brought their Christmas. Well, see, that's, that, I mean, for me, that's, that gets me jazzed up, but um, the, yeah, I just, I just always try to operate from, from that, from kindness and also with the understanding that I don't know what's going on in the other person's life. I don't know what they're dealing with. I don't know. Um, cause we're all fighting our own battles, you know, we're all, you know, a little bit broken. Um, but you know, I think through conversation, which is what I love about your show so much is that you are able to develop, um, real relationships. I mean, when we first did, when I first did your show the first time, we had just chatted like that Saturday. I just wanted to get to know you. And we had just chatted and then you had a guest drop out and you're like, hey, can you come on the show tomorrow? And I was like, uh, uh, sure, I guess. <laughs> and then three hours later, we're done recording, you know. Um, and then we talked for another hour after that. So, um, I think conversations are really important. I think a lot of people are scared to have conversations because they are so dug in on their own bias or their own point um, because their ego can't handle being wrong, but the only way to get to the truth is to sometimes be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. You know, it's okay to fail. Um, I know. So am I. 93. Um, but like, I just think that like, if we all kind of just step back a little bit, um, take the ego out, really try to start it with a victim or the case or whatever the thing is that we're trying to get the answer to. Start there and then, like, have the, like, understanding that we're all trying to get to the same spot and do it in as civil and, um, um, I don't want to say ethical now, um, <laughs> but in the most civil way. Um, and I just think that, that this would be a lot easier space to deal with. On the other hand, I mean, it is, these are emotionally charged cases. It's very it's really easy to sit here and say like hey we got to be really nice and we got to keep it you know civil and not get too emotional um but like and it brought but elon, elon musk said something very interesting yesterday or is it the i don't know the day before. <laughs> yeah day before yes when he was on the stage but he made this comment like wanting to be liked is a weakness yeah because it provides opportunity i was like wow this dude doesn't he doesn't get it huh. that like you don't have to be one to be liked to be liked. You right. just have to be nice. Yeah, that's true. That's and true. I think of so many of the creators within your space who I adamantly disagree with. Even Brandon Allis mm-hmm. right? on their Murdoch thing, I was like, yeah. Um, <laughs> and there are other things I really, I think on the Jameson's episodes, they just that totally disagree with them. But I can have like a respectful, cool conversation right. with them and many other people when I disagree on cases right. or I disagree on, I don't know, flowers or yeah. whatever it is. I wanted to just throw it to all you guys to make any closing comments you want to make and um, uh, before we turn it over to listeners. And if there are any listeners who are listening, because I can see there are some, if you go to the December 2nd Atlanta podcast uh, chat which is on the silver linings fireside chat and drop a question in there we'll take those questions too give you guys a chance to close then we'll turn it over to you guys for any questions so serve and need i just thank everybody for showing up and tuning in mm-hmm. right. same uh, you know no, I'd say same. <laughs> <laughs> She's, if an answer is taken if she gets the out I can't do it. <laughs> I appreciate the ability to have have a group of people to discuss things with, to to be able to do things like this and have an outlet for what I do. And I appreciate the people that listen and, and continue to come back and listen to me, even though I don't feel like, you know, my voice is worth listening to. I appreciate the ones that do. Well, that's right. Little does he know. <laughs> I mean, I think one, everyone's worth, worth listening to, but I definitely think like I'll skip ahead to mine. I appreciate being surrounded by so many people who have such good values and do good things, including you, 
be Robert. But uh, Jason, we are we already sorted. It. Yeah, it's just, no, no. I just I, again, I I appreciate um, the chance to get together with some awesome podcasters that let me dress like this around <laughs> them, and they're not embarrassed to be around me. Um, and um, you know, I just I, I'm thankful for everybody that's tuned into the show. I'm thankful for the opportunities I've had to be on, <laughs> excuse me, a guest on other shows. And um, Merry Christmas. Dana? So I just like to say ditto what everyone has said. Um, I really enjoy having these conversations. I am a big believer in collaboration over competition. And I think that that is part of the problem that we have today in the true crime world. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So I just want to say thank you um, to everyone who has listened to my podcast. I'm hoping I took a break. I was working for Uncovered as a um, consultant or, yeah, contractor. My contract is is coming to an end. And so I will be heading back into the podcasting. Forward to being right. out there promoting you. That's right. So, great. Uh, really, I, I just love doing anything like this. We're you know, around so many other podcasters that, you know, <clears throat> before I, I did CrimeCon the first time, I knew very few other podcasters other than just chatting online, but like actually getting together with people um, that are in the same kind of space. It's really amazing because you, I mean, Yes, you all have shows and stuff like that, and it's uh, uh, all, everybody has like a varying level of success and stuff like that. But when you just you're all together, and you're just chatting about everything that you're doing. It's like so so much amazing stuff, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. like bringing you know light to uh, you know, a person that otherwise probably wouldn't have it. You know, that's uh, that's something that like my show doesn't get into that. I, I really appreciate a lot of what you guys are doing. Because, I mean, yes, my mind is focused. It's, you know, it's really kind of its own thing. But, like, I, I hear stuff like this and I get inspired. I'm like, I, I want to do stuff like that. So <laughs> That's awesome. It's really good. Well, you know, you can always have a second podcast, Brandon. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm smart. <laughs> Trust me, Jason will start one of them. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and thank you guys. I really appreciate it. We're going to take some questions from these folks. I'm going to go ahead and start with one from uh, the chat. Um, and this is from Sophie, who some of you guys know. She's asking, she says, one thing I often think about is how each of these podcasts has for storytellers, and they each do it in a different, unique way. And I wonder how in doing these podcasts, um, <clears throat> much of their own lives, how much of their own lives have been altered by choosing to do a podcast and by the people and subjects they discuss. I can simply say every interview I do oh, changes me. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I have lots of things that happen, but I probably not had a year of growth like the year of growth I've had during this podcast. Yeah. It's not even possible. So, Nina, back to you. <laughs> so, I, you know, I didn't know that I would end up being a missing persons advocate on top of doing the podcast. And I've met a lot of great families and a lot of great uh, peace officers. And I'm really grateful for these relationships and how they've changed me and my perception about the world that I live in. Yep. 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 I feel that same. Same kind of. So for me, it it has given me a different perspective because like I said, I, I've listened to true crime. I've listened to podcasts for a very long time, but being in it and telling the stories. Cause, and, and that's one of the biggest things that I, I say is, I, you know, I haven't lived this and I haven't done and had to go through what people have to go through. I just tell the story and I want to tell it the best way possible. But I've learned so much about how, how us as a people fail other people. And it's horrible when we, when, you know, when we look at it in a, in a big scheme of things of why is this person getting the attention and why is it this person getting the attention? When you start mirroring those things, it's so frustrating to me. So that's, that's my push and my drive is that, that I want to make sure that every person has a, it's the same level field and, and everybody has the same chance of, of justice. Well, it's kind of cool that you actually got to bring that to life in, in an actual, Hey, still, it's part of the value of it. 
You bring Chase. Uh, so, how has it altered my life? That's the question. Um, well, it's we're all different story. Story. We're yeah. all storytellers in different ways. And what Sophie was essentially wondering, and we do it in our unique way. She was wondering how our own life stories are altered by choosing. Okay. Paths. Well. Um, I don't sleep very much. <laughs> I probably know more Christmas music than all of you combined. <laughs> um, you know, I, the way it's altered my life really is that I have been very fortunate to um, be allowed into this incredible network of people. Um, like I have so, I can call up almost any podcaster in the space and ask them to do a voice on the show. Or they'll call me up and ask to do a voice on the show. Um, and um, and I have roles for everybody. Brandon's been on a couple times already. <laughs> um, Brandon played an elf in one. Um, so, um, <laughs> was it a couple episodes? Could have been, yeah. been a couple episodes. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's just been a really uh, thrilling um, couple of years for me in this space. And I've had a lot of opportunities that have come out of it um, from, a, you know, business professional side so that's really exciting um but yeah it's just it's just been really cool to learn from everybody everybody's so much better at this than i am and i love just being around their genius and um i just appreciate uh the friendships i've made you know i'm about the podcast you can't i'll let you <laughs> i'll let you tell I, them well let me do it at, toward the end dana so i think for me uh this podcasting has given me the opportunity to really talk to families. I, you know, had imagined what it would be like. I, I feared that, you know, I have two sons and I, you know, I can't say as a mom, I wasn't worried that, you know, how I would I go on if something happened to one of my children and having the opportunity to sit with families who have literally experienced my, one of my biggest fears and to hear them, you know, really bring that to life every day that they, they live with this. Um, and then being able to connect those families either with resources or experts or so it has put me smack dab in the middle and Uncovered did this. Um, so um, working for Uncovered, we have worked with a lot of families. We've gotten their cases up on the site and now I can share resources. I can provide information. I can educate families or, you know, give them information they need. This, this might actually be a good moment for another one of the questions that we mm -hmm. got in the chat. Sorry, guys. Um, but Liz, who was in the chat, asked about thinking of that idea of helping people. Are there databases? Are there resources that can be cross-referenced for missing children? Mm -hmm. Like if you're not a podcaster or you're not a researcher, what? What can you, where can you go? What can we do? You, you, you the, the, the <laughs> so, missing. All right. <laughs> so, um, the Doe Network is a great website. The NamUs database, which is the National Missing Database, Missing and Unidentified Database. And that's the Department of Justice. Yes. Yes. Um, I uncovered. Want, I want to talk about the, the NamUs database. So I'm going to wait till you're done. Okay. okay. I want to address it. Okay. The Uncovered Database, um, there are about 50,000 cases in the wow. Uncovered Database. Those uh, have narratives, maps, timelines in many cases. Um, and so um, that would be, you know, those would be the databases. And then, of course, you know, we have a lot of nonprofit organizations who will work with families of missing and unidentified. Okay. One of my concerns about NamUs, it's a great resource and it's got a lot of good information, but states are not required to enter their missing into NamUs. Mm -hmm. So coming from Michigan, which had a population of roughly 10.5 million people, we have just, I'm guessing, 2,500 people in NamUs. Oh, wow. And then moving to Georgia, which also has a population of about 10.5 million people, there's only about 600 people in NamUs. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Because Georgia never required that people be entered, whereas Michigan had a huge campaign a few years ago led by the Michigan State Police to get people entered into NamUs. Mm -hmm. So if you're mm -hmm. listening, please ask your legislator yeah. to 
put forth something that makes missing people get entered into NamUs. Mm-hmm. For those other ones like the, you know, the Doe Network or some of the other ones you mentioned, do they, how do their databases get larger? Do they seek out cases? They're like more aggressive and assertive about getting information. So uh, the Doe Network adds as they can. They're a volunteer organization. So, you know, they, they're limited to their resources. Um, but it is a fantastic resource. I mean, it goes back years and, um, you know, Todd Matthews, um, who is the first citizen detective, um, solved a Doe case, um, in 1999, I believe started the Doe network, worked to also create the NamUs database with the government. Um, and Nina is so right about this where, you know, without law enforcement entering these cases, there are major holes and gaps. Tennessee, because Todd actually lives in the state of Tennessee, Tennessee has a really, like they're required. So they're one of the required states. But, that you know, there's 13 states, I think, um, in the United States required to add cases. So so those things get added by concerned, like, I, yes, exactly. And Uncovered is the same. They accept um, citizen uh, submissions, uh, families will come to Uncovered and ask th- ask that we add them to the database. So that's really what's driving it right now. We have never had law enforcement ask us to add a case to our database. So there's a huge gap there. Does the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have anything? NICMEC has mm-hmm. a database okay. that, that is searchable. Um, and, you know, they, they do great work, especially with some of the age progression photographs, but it's not always... Um, up to date or it's not always up to date. Um, and I, I don't want to say anything bad about Nick Mac because there's really yeah. nothing bad to say, but I, I think we all have their, their, their interface is not great. Mm-hmm. Okay. I find their interface from the club. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's their interface is mm-hmm. not terrific. Okay, all right. Well, that's good to know. I'm, I worked right down the street from them, so I'll start lotting. You see one guy with a sign, please picture <laughs> no, but they are great people. When are the three of you going to come on my show? <laughs> Whatever you want. Well, yeah. Whenever right. you want. Yeah, right. yeah, we'll wait. Whenever you want. Okay. <laughs> and I want to be something, like an elf uh, or something. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. I think wherever, who, who's going to be in, which one of us are going to be in, uh, in maybe season three? Please. Well, two of them will, yeah. I hope. <laughs> and then you're in the season finale of... Oh, Please, and I know you, I haven't given you your script yet. <laughs> so, um, but I, I finished I finished writing it for the fifteenth time the other day, uh, and I love it. I think I'm it's, excited because it's, it's not going to be the character everybody respects. I know exactly. It's going to be. It's actually you play. We talk about me introducing the conversations that people don't want to have. The character that you play is is a is a big conversation maker. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That's it. It it looks at um, sort of commerce and true crime. So you'll play a character that is very Which is like very hilarious, pro-act. right? Yeah, it's like the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think it'll be it'll be fun. I have a question. Yo, what's the podcast you're going to do together? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah that's so right. our concept. Um, is essentially a podcast that really focuses on telling the stories and people who have been able to bring some good out of tragedies. I'm just so thinking of people who are like victims of crime, family members, law enforcement, even convicted criminals who've been released and done something good, but being able to look at these very difficult events, kind of like you guys were talking about at the end, a lot of the stories in true crime end with a sad art. Mm-hmm. So picking up the ball on the stories that yeah. if it were not for that bad thing, something good wouldn't come into the world. And so I we sort of we we thought of people like Stacey Chapin and Ethan Chapin's mom in the University of Idaho. Um and Ethan Smile charity and the students who are now going to school mm-hmm. because of that. We th- and they're also partnering with a group that um is working on missing and murder Native American women. Or somebody like Bruce Maitland, who, when his daughter Brianna went missing, part of his work afterwards uh, led to, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, it's the investigators. Private investigations for the missing. Investigations for the missing. 
or even someone, even though I know she's somewhat controversial, Amanda Knox, right? She went through that terrible situation where she was wrongfully convicted in Italy and has come back and become an advocate around all sorts of different things. So sort of exploring and telling those stories is where we're sometime yeah. in 2024. Yep. I love that idea yeah, because idea. there are so many families who have bounced back in that, you know, I've pushed forward, I think, yeah. and it's been healing to them to create a foundation or to enact a, you know, law, a new law or something like that. So you will, it, it will be, I, I will be listening for sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for sure. Pressure's on now. Yeah. I know, oh, I know. Now you said it out loud. Yeah, I know. Just to, <laughs> to cut that out of the uh, yeah. finished uh, episode. <laughs> I, for the record, I didn't tell him I would be springing this one on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Took me no by pressure. surprise. No pressure. No right. pressure at all. Anything else, guys? Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. I really appreciate having you guys here. Um, going back to what I was saying in the beginning, it's so I, shocking to me that I would find my people <laughs> in either podcasting or in the true crime community, but I really do love your values. I appreciate you. I feel the same way Carly does when she was saying, like, I've met wonderful friends here, um, friends who have been supportive and kind and, and loving and compassionate and, you know, anything I can do to help you guys bring more good in the world, just let me know. Awesome. It's a wrap. <laughs> Very good. I'm stop recording. <laughs> I'm Jason Blair, and this is the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast. We'll see you all again in a few days.